We're going to do a panel talking about the benefits of Python for startups. Great panel. We'll start with a quick introduction of each person on the panel, who you are, what you do, some funny story about yourself that is um, suitable for family viewing. And then we'll come back through and give each one of you a minute or two to give kind of an opening statement on some aspect of this topic that you care a lot about or you think is really important. Uh, we will start with Wes. Tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Wes Winham. I'm the founder of a startup called Woven. Uh, Woven helps high growth companies hire better fit developers faster. Um, we don't think resumes are a great way, so we, we do something different. Uh, let's see, we, my last startup, we used Python and Django. This one, we're polyglot. We use uh, Python mostly for ML. We, we do PyTorch to help evaluate some uh, candidate work, which PyTorch is amazing if you haven't played with it. Um, funny story about me. So I guess I am an advocate for rats as pets. It's kind of weird, but if you don't have a backyard especially and you like dogs, you'll love rats. Nice. We have to retire the trophy on that one. Um, Jason, tell us about yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Rowley. Uh, I am the uh, principal uh, data, data journalist for Crunchbase News. Uh, I primarily uh, analyze uh, venture capital and startup trends uh, for them. And uh, when I'm not uh, munching and crunching all of Crunchbase, I, I, uh, I do some volunteer work with the PSF helping to organize uh, Startup Row, which is a uh, free booth space for startups uh, at uh, PyCon US. Um, as far as funny stories, I'm really bad at coming up with, uh, with ideas for funny stories. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had the very fun experience of uh, hitting my own personal land speed record at the Bonneville Salt Flats, and then uh, proceeding to uh, spend uh, about 50 or $60 on like three different car washes to get all the salt, salt out <laughs> from the bottom of my car. But it was, uh, it was, it was totally worth it. So. All right. Uh, by the way, thanks for doing that for the PSF. That is a, I've always viewed Python as a market as much as a technology. Uh, Dwayne, thank you for joining us on the panel. Tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Dwayne Musser. I'm heading up the engineering team here at Double Map, which uh, was recently acquired by Ford Smart Mobility. So don't know if I were much of a startup anymore. I am not one of the original founders, but I've uh, taken over the lead here. I'm trying to get uh, everything going and growing. So um, it's been a lot of fun, but uh, funny story about me. Um, I don't know what's safer here, so I'll say uh, uh, the funniest thing that most people on here will find is that I've spent uh, 20 years of my life uh, focusing mainly on Java in that huge uh, ecosphere. So uh, moving to a company where we can do something with my second language, Python, is, uh, or I do many languages, but the second favorite language here, Python, has been uh, great. That's something people say, Python is everybody's second favorite language. <laughs> uh calvin our conference hostess with the mostest give us I an introduction and a story sure uh so calvin hendricks parker i'm co-founder and cto here at six feet up and i also run co-founded and co-organize with a lot of help all the indie pie things that go on here because i could definitely do that stuff by myself that is, that is not my uh, forte uh i'm also we kind of a little bit of background on why I would even sit in on a Python for startups um, board. We don't typically do work for a lot of startups, but we are recently. So we're actually an investor and doing development work on a startup right now. A funny story. My gosh, where to begin? Uh, one of the second or third times I ever met Paul Everett was in Naples, Italy. And we had booked a hotel with a gentleman by the name of Godfrey Chappelle. And we woke up the first morning and it, the room, he and I were sharing a room and Godfall was in another room and the room reeked. I was like, oh my God, I hope I didn't do that. <clears throat> so we go to breakfast, come down to breakfast. Paul's like, I'm so sorry. I go, he's like, I thought that was me. He goes, no, I think our hotel is right in front of a sulfur hot spring right behind the hotel. So that was what the smell was. Volcanoes for the win. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, I'll do a poll of the four of you. How many of you work 
mostly or significantly out of your house. It's the way to live. All right. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, go back through the line. And the topic is Python for startups. Got a series of questions. We'll be taking questions from the audience as well. Give an opening statement about the topic, your feelings on the topic, or some key essential point you think everybody should know. We will start again with Wes. Startups are startups live and die by the rate at which you learn. Uh, the best way to learn is run experiments. Python is it's tough to beat Python for experimentation speed, the ability to build something, get out in front of users learn what you screwed up, why you're wrong, and make another iteration. Um, especially when it comes to web development, especially if you're touching machine learning, especially comparing, comparing something like TensorFlow to PyTorch. Just the uh, experimentation speed is such a huge advantage, and startups die when they don't learn faster than they burn cash. So I think Python's a, an amazing choice uh, for startups. I could, I could have come up with 10 things. All of them would have been worse than that. Uh, Jason, interested to hear what you had to say. Yeah, so uh, the things that I've found most uh, interesting and relevant about Python to startups is that it's a very easy to learn uh, language and uh, it's pretty easy to you know pick up new uh, libraries uh, as, as needed. And the things that, that are most interesting and relevant for startups is that uh, it, it's an incredibly rich ecosystem of open source uh, technologies that uh, new ventures can sort of pick up and run with uh, and build on top of. Uh, and, and also that all of the sort of hottest areas right now uh, amongst, you know, the venture investing class. Uh, so the, you know, your machine learning type startups, your nat natural language processing type startups, uh, you know, we're sort of very fortunate to have incredibly diverse uh, and and very rich ecosystems of uh, of open source technologies uh, built specifically for those application areas, um, and uh, they just get you know better and 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 more expansive over time. Just out of curiosity, what's the uh, cardinality of the slope in the market for startups right now? Going up, going down? Uh, okay, so this <laughs> this gets into some reporting that we did uh, fairly recently. In terms of uh, deal volume, uh, nationally and internationally, uh, we're sort of flat uh, for the past few quarters. Um, dollar volume uh, has been on the decline, uh, primarily because a lot of the companies that, had to r that have raised the most money um, have since sort of graduated to raising from public markets. Uh -huh. um, so uh, there's a little bit of a generational gap between uh, who's raising big rounds right now versus, uh, you know, who's historically raised the most money in the past. Does that mean we can go a couple of months without a story about the Wii company? Uh, no, that <laughs> just because their IPO is coming right down the pipe and uh, it's, it's going to be uh, very interesting from a journalist perspective uh, to, to cover that one. All right, Dwayne, give me your take on uh, Python and startups. I love Python at startups. I, I believe in staying very lean. I mean, kind of akin to what Wes and Jason were both alluding to. You want to get something, you want to get it fast. You don't want a bunch of overhead to deliver something. So anything that can let you get a product in front of users faster is great. Python, it's easy to find smart people willing to go with it. It's easy to develop the community of being able to find libraries to do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting in areas that aren't your primary focus is great. So having that ability to jump in, do what you want to do, get it in front of customers and just deliver is essential and it's great. That part where you said easy to find people, is that something you just say on webinar panels or is it actually true? I haven't had a problem yet. All right. so. I can't say uh, forever it will be that way, but I, maybe I'm just fortunate. Knock on wood, right? Exactly. All right, Calvin, you've been living the dream. Tell us about Python and startups. Oh my gosh, I've been, I've been living the dream of a company that makes money from day one versus a startup, generally. I do have two things I think I'd want to add to that. Uh, the first one is the Python community. I think groups like doing Startup Row, so the initiative that Jason helps out with, is incredibly helpful for 
<clears throat> Python based startups to get the exposure they need to get that level of funding that they need. The second thing I wanted to mention was we saw, at least around the Indianapolis area, a proliferation of Rails shops doing and people doing uh, Ruby for startups early on. And that seems to have leveled off, died down. And the uh, steady, I think Django seems to have followed Python's steady popularity curve uh, versus that hype cycle of like a huge peak fall level off. And I think that it has helped the consistency of the Python language to have frameworks like Django and, and even Zope and Plone, those kinds of things that are super stable, just work day in, day out. And now people are choosing those because they want stability in their startup. Yep. Uh, I've got a question that we'll get back to on that about um, Python being more than just a language and, and what that means for startups. So I've got a series of questions. We'll be taking questions that come in. Um, and so I'll start and split them up for now, uh, two people at a time. And this one, I'll go with Wes and Dwayne. What is and isn't a startup, since that's in the title of this panel? Wes, you want to go first? Sure. There's a lot of definitions of, of this. I, I like there's like the, I think the Paul Graham is like searching for a repeatable business model uh, or organization searching for a repeatable business model. Um, and also, I think growth has to be a part of a startup definition, or at least my definition. A company mm -hmm. that uh, puts growth, if not, if not second, if if not first, at least second. That has to be really important. Um, that's to differentiate versus a small business. So I think we've got uh, growth and uncertainty are the the two biggest things that make a startup not a business. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, consulting you might want to grow, but there's not a lot of uncertainty there. You you know mm -hmm. what a consulting organization looks like. Uh, I am building a product that for the first year, I didn't know if anyone wanted. I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if we could sell it, even if it did work. And we're reducing uncertainty. Um, but that, that's kind of what's particularly hard and kind of bonkers about a startup versus another business. How do you know when you're no longer a startup? I think it's more of a, uh, I think it's more less binary and more of a phase. And I think that mm. all, if, if you want to keep growing as a business, you always have parts of your business that are a startup. Um, I think Google has startups within Google. Mm, uh, true. There's parts that are like, all right, I've gone from the Peter Thiel model here is, are you going from zero to one? Are you going from one to N? I would say the more you're going from one to N is like, all right, I've got this. I can, I can repeat this. I can, I can optimize. So that's less startup-y. Um, yeah. If I'm going from zero to one, I don't know if this will work. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's valuable. I don't know if it's usable. I don't know if it's viable. I'd say that's more startup-y. I think we yeah. all we get a portfolio of uh, small startups and not startups within our organizations. As that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Dwayne, you agree with the framing? Got anything to add to that? Yeah, I really like the uh, level of uncertainty, uh, that concept there of saying, yeah, if you have some uncertainty there, do you have a product that you're just trying to give to people or is there something where you're trying to make something? And I think uh, trying to solve a problem that you may see that someone else doesn't is really that key concept of a startup, whether small company or big company. I've worked in some big companies where we had six people in a room and it's like we need to do x and we don't know what we're going to do to get there but you guys are going to figure that out so i mean it's a great situation i would call that a startup because could we deliver who knows but it's it's a great idea to start and try you don't know where you're going but focusing on that so that uncertainty the um, ability the problem solving mindset if you're really just focusing on doing the next task, it's uh, probably a little less of a startup, more than figuring things out as you go, learning and experimenting, which goes again back to Wes's uh, earlier comments. But uh, key parts of really what I would consider being a startup is that uh, really the mindset of being a startup. Quick follow-up. You mentioned, and it's a good point, a Fortune 500 could have an internal startup. Yes. Or at least that mentality or something. Could a government agency? I've actually seen that uh, happen. Um, well, I guess it was a contractor to a government agency, but 
actually run within a very startup type mindset right. of, hey, we have to solve this problem and we're kind of not dealing with the normal bureaucracy. Let's go figure it out, then introduce it to the bureaucracy. So I will suspend this belief. Okay, right, on to the next question. Um, and this will go to uh, Jason, you're going to be a really good one for this, but, but also Calvin from your uh, many decades, centuries, decades in Python. Python is a language. I used to talk about this when I would give business model talks. Python is a language, but it's also an ecosystem, um, a community. It's a market. It's a brand. And as a small startup without a brand, you can ride the coattails of a larger brand when you're putting in a bid and say, we're Django. Oh, I know Django. What are these, what are these things that I just mentioned, Python being more than language, what of those are actually beneficial for startups and how? Jason first. Sure. So uh, I would say it's sort of all the above, you know, like, but the areas that I'm sort of most interested in uh, and the PSF is most interested in uh, from the from the perspective of organizing startup row is really the uh, the the community and the market component. Um, so I'll start first with the market component. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a really uh, interesting company uh, from uh, the UK uh, to I think they're from Cambridge. Uh, PhDs uh, started a company called Anvil. Anvil lets you do uh, basically build uh, uh, interactive, uh, you know, web apps in mm -hmm. uh, in browser without having to. Uh... While he's frozen, I'll Absolutely. say that idea sounds really similar. Yeah, Jason, you're breaking up a little bit. But Paul, who else? Uh, uh, sorry, the game application development environment. Let, let's see if we got Jason back. Jason, you back? Jason, you back? Uh, yeah, I'm back. All right. I believe I'm back. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes. OK. Um, so, so Anvil is an example of, of a company as they're in, uh, you know, as far as the um, you know, the community aspects or the ecosystem aspects, you know, that's when you get to a much sort of further afield, um, uh, you know, more, more abstract uh, sort of discussion. But, um, you know, a, a really great example of uh, startups giving back to the broader Python ecosystem is, a, uh, is actually one that, that failed. Uh, it's a company called uh, Lambda, uh, it was called uh, Lambda Foundry. Um, but uh, they, you know, it was founded by, uh, I forget, uh, pardon me, I'm forgetting the, the name of the founder at the moment. Um, but they, out of their uh, sort of financial uh, statistical analysis uh, software, they ended up open sourcing a tool that I use every day, uh, Pandas. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's all sorts of examples of, of organizations, you know, building on top of and giving back to, uh, to, to, the, to the Python uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, and broader community. Um, yeah, I'll comment on that. The, the with Anvil, that money went to me seeing them at their booth at Pi Bay this past weekend. Wow! And and the money without the money they wouldn't have been there. And Python was a channel to a market where they could go to a place and meet people. Yeah. And so that was that's an interesting point. Um, Calvin, your thoughts? That's interesting because I mean I think Python is the as a technology that you would use to pitch to like VCs is an area where I don't have a lot of experience, but I can't imagine if you had said the same question five years ago, six years ago, I think you wouldn't have gotten the same response from people. They wouldn't have used that as a benefit maybe because Python would have been less known in the ecosystem for this type of, uh, this type of work. So they probably would have kept it in the background. <clears throat> we have an amazing engineering team. We're doing all these things. But now I think that they, if they can say Python, I think the confidence level is there mm. uh, with investors to be like, ah, they picked a, well, what's the thing? You, know, you get two boring technologies uh, when, you, when you build your startup, right? So as soon as you add in you know, the third or fourth edgy thing, uh, or no, you get, you get two tokens, right, for edgy technologies. Everything else better be boring. It, it, that, that's it's the other way around. And I think 
finally, I mean, Python definitely doesn't fall into the edgy technology. Django doesn't fall into edgy technology. Pandas definitely does not fall into edgy technology anymore. Yeah, when uh, I did my first round of investment in 97, Python was a liability, not an asset. Mm -hmm. And then when we did the 14 million round a few years later and hired the Python Labs team, it was a brand that we put into the pitch. Uh, okay, so the next one's gonna be a free for all and then we'll go to a question from Carol. Uh, so for free for all, just raise your hand and if you've got something important to say on it. When is Python the wrong choice? Who wants to go? How can it be the wrong choice? It's everyone's second for a favorite. Startup. <laughs> for a startup. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Wes? It's the wrong choice uh, when it would impede your ability to go fast and experiment. So specifically, mm. I think a team, the team is the biggest factor here. So my co-founders are Rubyists. So mm. our core application is written in Rails. I can make the theoretical argument about why well, uh, machine learning and PyTorch are a big part of our stack. If we were in Django and Python, well, that would be nice because we wouldn't have to learn two, uh, two languages. We would have the same infrastructure. But in reality, moving fast was the most important part for my startup. startup. And the objective best choice of use Python for everything uh, would have been the wrong choice for our team. So we have Rails, and then we have Python, uh, where it's the right tool. Yep. yep. But, but Wes, didn't you, I mean, I met with you long, long ago, and I think you said you even started trying to do Python for everything at the beginning. Is that incorrect? I, I wrote some Python and I uh, pushed on some Python. That did not last very long. They, they yeah. my co-founders very correctly uh, pointed out we could go faster in Rails and then, you know, they were like almost instantly beyond what I had done in Python. All right, let's go to Carol's question and maybe we'll get all of you to answer on this. Uh, we'll start maybe with Dwayne. As a startup, how do you know when to quit? Is there a time when you or the founders or the investors or whoever might have thrown in the towel, should have thrown in the towel, but you turned the corner? It's a very good question. I think, uh, probably not the best answer to this, but uh, my approach would be to quit when there is no viable way out. If you, what was your love has just now become your pain and you're not able to find the next step to keep you interested, uh, maybe you're going down the wrong path. Uh, some paths take you to a dead end. They look bright and fantastic, but then you run into the wall. So when you're not able to find that next step that actually takes you forward um, anymore and you can't find a way to get to that next step, it's kind of time to give up. But, uh, but I like to think of things from the uh, problem solving point of view and uh, financially there may be some other considerations there as well. I gotta think, that, I, I gotta think as entrepreneur, I mean, startup people are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs mm -hmm are definitely known for their perseverance and their sometimes maybe stubbornness. It would be really hard to judge that as a person who's just in the middle of it sometimes. Mm. I've seen so many like failed startups where the person you're just like, why didn't you stop six months before, three months before, or before you just kind of ruined, I mean, gone down just a, a, a big rat hole of, of no, no good productivity. Right. So I feel like it's going to be hard for us. And I'm not, a, I, I'm, I'm, we're a 20 year old startup or a consulting company. We don't have the same kind of like issues. We made money from day one kind of thing. We don't have VC. So it's a lot easier for me to persist and, and keep going because the, the clients keep paying the bill. But when you've got to go raise money and you've got to depend on like that funding source or you're using your own money to fund this thing, I think it's gotta be really easy to, to maybe overshoot the mark and, yeah. And feel like you could, you're a little bit invincible and can keep going just based on the personalities of the kind of people who would even do attempt this level of a, a feat. Jason or Wes, either of you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it really depends on what stage you know your startup is at. So you know if if you're uh, you know if if you're a one person team or if you're a two person team, 
and you're trying, a, you know, you have an idea and you're working on, you know, building it out and getting some initial, uh, you know, feedback and traction, it's much easier to, to, to abandon a, a venture at that stage, right? If, if, if something doesn't work out, if you fail to get that traction, uh, you know, everybody can sort of pack it up and go home and say, uh, we, you know, we try, right? Yep. But the tough part is, is, you know, once you get outside, you know, venture, venture funding, like the, those investors have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors to maximize, you know, their returns. And so if you are working in a company that's, you know, not working out, you know, as, as a founder, like, and you've taken outside money, you know, you're now sort of duty bound to find a, uh, find some sort of an exit that, that is, that does not result in a total write down of, uh, of the, of those investors investment in you. Um, and so at that point, you know, it becomes a little bit more difficult, uh, around, you know, you have to find an acquirer or, right. or, or something like that. Um, and, and in that case, you know, it just makes, it probably makes more sense to say that you're, you're quitting, um, your startup or exiting your startup, uh, because, you know, it, it had a better opportunity to grow, you know, under the aegis of a, of a bigger company, um, or, or, or a different team. Yeah. I had an experience in 96 where, uh, we were waiting for a check from our big contract and we were going to miss payroll and we, my co-founder and I, Rob Page and I went into the office with the agreement that if we put the numbers in the spreadsheet and got X, we were going to announce to everybody the next day we were shutting down. We put the numbers in, we got X and I called my wife and she said, I can't believe you're going to quit after. And two days later we got the check. Hey, nice. So, <laughs> so I mean, sometimes it, again, it's, it's operating. That's the back to the uncertainty point. You know, you, it's sort of an information vacuum until yep. uh, until everything sort of collapses into the truth. Yep. All right. Next question. Um, I love like this is a thing that I think about a lot because like yeah. I'm I'm in deciding that, you know, we are pre like clear success. Uh, we haven't raised our seed round. I'm fundraising right now. Uh, for me, I don't trust my opinions in the moment at all. I don't trust my ability to say, is this a problem I can solve or not? I think I think in the moment it's, it's what. Uh, short-term Wes is dumb. He's impulsive. He's influenced by whether he had his last meal, how well did he sleep last night. Uh, I try to take decisions like that away from short-term Wes and set uh, a time uh. box. So with my, with my startup and my founders, we agreed. So first thing is what's an outside in estimate. Okay. For startups that are B2B SaaS, how long does it take to kind of get an idea whether you're going to totally fail? We heard two years ish. So it's like, all right, we are not going to even ask ourselves if we're failing until two years happens. So that's what we agreed on. And that's coming up in, in November. Um, and then everything else in between there, I don't even have to think about it. I just say like, we're going to freaking figure it out uh, and, and try to be confident because that, uh, I think that belief gives us energy and makes mm -hmm. it actually possible to figure it out. I think the belief the other way would absolutely be true. If we believe we couldn't, we would fail. And the time box because uh, the the like the 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 malignant case of that confidence is we just run right off a cliff and you know uh, hurt our team, hurt mm -hmm. my co-founders. So our our the best we got is we we set a time box and we're gonna we're gonna talk about it uh, in November and have my some condolences for going through the C round. That's not no. a yeah 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 sitting I across the paycheck. table from twenty five year olds who've never run a lemonade stand, but they're between you and ten million dollars. Right. I, I, I just read Shoe Dog, the mm. memoir of the Nike guy, and it actually makes me appreciate venture capital. Like he ran a high growth business with a bank that was like, stop growing so fast. This is this is risky. And he's like doubling every year. And like <laughs> I have people that are like, how can you grow fast? And that's what I want to do because I want to make an impact. Yeah. And these are these people that they, they sprung up in the 70s to create the path to a public company that I want to take. So. Let's go on to a question, the first audience question after um, Carol. And we'll send this to Jason and Calvin. Can you use Python effectively for distributable software like editors or standalone consumer games? Something discussed by Russell Keith McGee, if I recall correctly. Calvin, you want to start with that? Well, I think 
Dropbox demonstrated you could, but it sounds like they're going to go back on that. <clears throat> so I, I don't know where we really stand on that. I, I think there's a lot of great software that is distributed with Python underneath that you don't see. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've, as a community, always had a packaging uh, problem. Uh, you know, distribution of Python has, has evolved many, many times and never been simple. So yeah. I've never attempted to distribute a Python binary to consumers. Uh, you know, all our deliveries through the web, so that's easy because I control all the machines that it goes onto. But I do know that our you know groups that do it. Yeah, oh, Jason, you got more. Insight I don't. In yeah, I mean, so I I don't have. Uh, I'm I'm also sort of like trying to trying to grasp for a couple of examples here, um, because a lot of the a, a lot of the, the ways in which startups, or a lot of the ways in which people interface with the software that startups build using Python is uh, primarily through, uh, you know, web applications. Um, as far as something that can be downloaded and, and installed, I'm trying, again, I'm, I'm trying to think of good examples. Um, Nihilus, the, uh, the email, the email, uh, an email client um, was, uh, uh, was, was downloadable um, and installable in, in the sort of more, classic type you yeah. know app application sense but um but yeah it's 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 primarily uh distributed through the web jason were you uh at russell's keynote on black swans at pycon this year i i certainly was do you remember him talking about one of the three uh existential threats is distribution the distribution yep. problem yep and i think and he was also targeting mobile right yes and so this is this should be read to anybody in the audience as uh, you know as an opportunity, right? It's a wow. largely unsolved problem, uh, and you know if you're able to come up with a packaging and distribution solution uh, that that you know that works really well, you know that's uh, that's a business right there. All or, right, next question, and all of you can chime in on it in a vector that you're interested in. Do you th ever think we're at peak Python? We'll start with Dwayne. So can you define that for me? I want to let you choose whether it's developers or brand or adoption or popularity or any vector that is the vector important to you. I honestly haven't thought about it, but I really, really hope not. I, I think we're, at least in my career, in my life, I see it as kind of a, a growing vector and becoming more important in many ways. So um, I look at it from that perspective and stay optimistic that, no, I don't think we are. All right. Uh, quick answers. Wes, what do you think? Uh, if it's defined by a percentage of development, might be JavaScript's big if defined by number of folks doing Python. Definitely not software right. in the world. All right, uh, Calvin. I don't think we are. Uh, I, oh yeah, I'm on here. So uh, there was a, a tweet storm that went around a couple weeks ago about the Python ecosystem, kind of tragedy of the commons uh, type thing, which claimed we're getting way more users than we are people who are willing to maintain things. And I think that's just a, a noisy minority uh, to me. But from the perspective of going out and selling and convincing people to do business with you. Not Way more opportunity still All right. to go. All right, Jason? Yeah, no, I, I do not think that we're at, uh, at, at peak Python. Um, I think, you know, there's a whole generation of, uh, of, of folks who are, you know, learning to code in school and, you know, more and more the, that language of choice is, is Python. So there's going to be many more, you know, young developers, you know, coming into the, the ecosystem over time. Um, there's always going to be, uh, just as, as, you know, businesses generate much more data, there's going to be more demand for uh, data science and, and data analysis skills. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for, for growth on the machine learning and, and AI type technologies to be packaged into uh, uh, n not necessarily, you know, consumer, you know, type, type, uh, uh, applications, but, um, but more prosumer type stuff. Uh, I, I don't see there being, uh, 
uh, a, a trail off in, in interest or activity in the space um, anytime soon. Maybe we are actually at peak Excel. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, no, because Excel is, uh, uh, I think they're going to be integrating Python at some point in the near future. Oh, right. right. They saw their salvation uh, coming. Yeah, there was an AMA with, on Reddit with the Excel development team, and there was a lot of discussion about Second about, life. Yeah, so. I'll do my imitation of John McLaughlin from the old McLaughlin group and say, answer, not at peak. Next right. question. <laughs> um, I'd like to pose this to all four of you because you have very different backgrounds and, um, and represent different voices. I'd like all of you to give your perspective on this one because for me and probably for Calvin as well, for a long period of time, this was the limiting factor. Ever had any trouble hiring Python? I mean, you say for you and me, we, because we've been around so long, yes, mm -hmm. we have ever had problems hiring Python people, absolutely. But that's one of the reasons I started the IndyPy group here is to find those people here locally. And I'll add to this, um, uh, how important is finding developers to you? So, Dwayne. So, yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't had problems yet. Um, luckily, I've just, through connections and connections, been able to get uh, what I've needed. And what I've found more important is instead of finding people who know Python is finding people It's like, hey, this is the way we're going. And they're like, yeah, I could dig this. I can pick up this language and do what I need to do and learn it effectively and quickly. And hiring engineers is very important to me. I'm on a big growing team, if anyone out there is ever uh, wondering. So, uh, um, so yeah, definitely I don't see a problem and haven't had a problem with people even being interested in learning it if they're uh, open to learning new things. As a Python old timer, it cracks me up to go to PyCon and see freaking Capital One or JP Morgan begging people to come do Python for them. It just is hilarious. Wes. I've, I've lived like different lives in here. So I think it's like, if I get to hire my network, it's like, yeah, this is easy. I know, I know these folks and it's a point where my scale out of my network. And I think to the extent I've been able to hire remote and more junior, I've not had a problem. Uh, and to the extent I'm able to hire people step, switching to Python, less problem to the extent that I need to hire folks more senior with specific technology background with a specific location, man, it's really hard. Senior mm -hmm. engineers are on the mar market for like 10, 15 days right now. It's like mm -hmm. someone's going to make an offer. Uh, so that's, that's never really been hard. It's a great time to be a senior engineer. Uh, looking, looking hey, I'm going to come back to that in just a second with an ad lib question. Uh, Jason. Yeah, so as a, as a data journalist, I'm not, I'm personally not doing uh, much in the way of hiring uh, a Python engineers. So I don't, I don't have much to, to speak to that. But, um, you know, in startups, there's, I, I, I often sort of sense whenever I talk to, to, to founders and to, um, to, to other folks on teams, there's, there's always this sort of tension between, you know, the, the sales and the business side, and the, the tech and the engineering side. And, you know, I always, I come down to, I come down on the side of, of, you know, it's really important to have uh, really great engineers because they're the ones that are building the thing that is, that, that is sufficiently valuable for the sales team or the marketing team to go out and sell or, or, or market to the, to the world. So um, yeah, I, it's, I, the, having good, good uh, engineering talent is incredibly important to, uh, uh, at the startup stage. All right, surprise. Well, I'm, oh, sorry, Calvin, go ahead. I was going I, I, I to take an opposite side to that, even though I may not believe it fully. <laughs> the hiring of, of great tech talent, because that is the engine for your startup, I don't think it has a direct correlation to the success of your startup, because I think that comes down to exposure, marketing, all these yes. other things that you could still have a, a you don't need a 10x developer, you know, as we've seen you know, through numerous keynotes. Uh, I think you just need to be able to deliver. So it just, to, to hear you say that, you know, that's that heart and soul and the, we're going to build it and they're going to come. I think that is a little misleading. Yeah. Yep. Fair point. All right. I'm going to do a follow up to Wes on something you said. I'm not asking this question out of vested interest. 
is ageism a thing in our industry? <laughs> I, I think it's, um, careful. I don't know careful. if it's specifically ageism, but I know people have ideas in their head about what's the right profile of person. Mm. And it often has a certain experience level. And I think there's a lot of like not adaptive stereotypes about the type of person that would want a type of job. And I think that definitely hits uh, people like with more experience, especially I think like especially, people hypothetically 51 years old and who startups want to hire. Yeah. Just I, saying. I think I've heard people say that they would be great, but I, I don't know. I think they've got, uh, they would want to do more, you know, we yeah. just got a boring job and it's just mm-hmm. like, why don't you ask them? Like, that sounds like a good conversation. Yeah. yeah. A lot of wisdom in those old timers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I've heard it the other way too. And being on this side of it, it's always the, uh, are they the right culture fit? So. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. On to the last question. And then if Mary Beth allocates a little bit of time for us, I'll give you a closing statement. And uh, this last question is for all of you. Um, Python is great for what I'll call the low end, the beginning of programming. Uh, such an easy language to learn. It's becoming taught everywhere. Does it have a problem scaling? And by scaling, I might mean raw performance execution, size of the project, complexity, tooling, whatever. We will start with Jason. Uh, I'm sorry, you it, you broke up there for, for a hot second. What was the last part of your question? Um, by performance and scaling, by scaling, I might mean performance, ah. raw execution, but it b- might just mean complexity or tooling. Um, and whether that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, I, I, I don't have much to contribute on, on that front, unfortunately. Right. Um, I've not had, uh, I, I've not experienced too much in the way of, uh, of, of difficulty getting, uh, code that I write to, uh, to, to run well and run quickly. Um, but then again, my needs are are very different from uh, from say a company building a web app or um, or 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 other sorts of uh, other sorts of applications. All right, thirty seconds or less, Calvin. I think prior to Python three six, that was true. I think post Python three six in the new async world, uh, I think a lot of companies who have moved to Rust, Go, et cetera, wouldn't be there if they had the facilities available they have now. Mm. All right, that's provocative. Wes, argue with them. I think if you're bigger than Instagram or Dropbox or Google, you might have scaling problems. You have the winning one on that. But Dwayne, you can give your opinion. To <laughs> yeah, he's good. I can say uh, I've always had my doubts. It's done better than I thought, but it definitely is not fresh out of the box. Something that scales as easily as some other things. Right, right. All right, closing thoughts. We'll go round robin. Um, Give us some walk away, take away points about Python startups business. We will start with Wes. Python's ecosystem is the most powerful ecosystem built up around any language. That means you can solve your machine learning problems. You can build your web app. You can build your uh, data analysis problems all in Python with great support, with open source uh, uh, vendors so you don't have business risk. It's, it's, a, it's a really great choice, especially if you have folks that know Python and want to do it, and there's tons of those. Several good points in there. Uh, Dwayne? Uh, Python's great to get something out, to keep that lean approach. It's wide enough and deep enough to get everything out, so it's perfect for startups and that, and uh, you can look at the harder questions later if you need to and if you ever That's need to. That's a good point. Jason, the authority, give it to us. Oh gosh. Um, uh, So Startup Row is a fantastic way to connect your startup with the broader Python ecosystem. We've been uh, incredibly grateful to all the founders that have participated uh, over the years. Um, That includes, you know, the likes of of Anvil and, and, and Mixpanel and uh, Docker was was a uh, was a was a Python start a Python startup bro company as well, uh, and so if you are currently working on a venture uh, that has 15 or fewer people on the team that you've been working on uh, for two and a half years or fewer, uh, and obviously use Python somewhere in your stack, uh, consider applying to uh, Startup Row. 
uh, for uh, PyCon 2020. Total Pro is awesome. It got us a, it got us a customer. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, Jason, you should do a PSF blog post of a startup row retrospective and tell oh, that yeah. story. Oh no, yeah. I have a, I have all sorts of uh, fun, fun data to, to report at some point in the near future. All right. Calvin, get us out of here. I will end with the approachability of Python as a language and the community. Uh, I think the people are some of the friendliest I've ever run into. And I think as a startup, that's one less thing you got to worry about. Uh, when it comes to, you know, wrestling with, wrangling with, trying to integrate with, uh, Python gives you a lot of advantages just to get started. All right. Uh, thank you to the audience for sticking around and listening. Uh, thank you to the panelists. This was fun. We could go on for several more hours. Thank you, Indy Pie, for dreaming this up. And on to the next sessions.